Um, so um, this afternoon, I want to talk a little bit about um, energy storage in general um, and to put it into some kind of context and then drill down in a couple of um, focus areas. It's a little bit of a top level presentation, but I hope you forgive me for that. Let me see if this works the right way. Um, so first of all, I want to go on to have a look at the overall energy landscape. And here I would say the message is, is that the landscape's constantly evolving. It's basically linked to the amount of renewable integration that you're going to have. And that has basically two effects. One, it affects obviously the technology that's going to be needed. The other side it, it affects is the market um, construct or the market systems that we need to have in order to make it work. And you can see that today we're probably around what we call the system integration side. And as you increase the, um, the, the renewable integration, the role of storage becomes increasingly important and also the types of storage that you need will begin to change. Um, the other takeaway message is that this is not a homogenous somehow view across the whole world. So different parts of the world are progressing down this roadmap at, um, at differing rates. So um, if we then take that and we also match it with where do we see energy storage in the future, then well, pretty much everywhere, um, ranging from um, at next to generation assets down to basically behind the grid and residential, etc. The other side of the things is, is that when you look at energy storage, um, you have to understand that there's not just electricity energy storage, there's also power to heat storage coming in. Um, also, um, in, in order to uh, address that energy landscape that we've uh, just shown, there's other technologies which are also important, like CHP, um, like distributed generation below 5 megawatts, obviously the renewable side of things. There's also this whole area of power to chemicals, which I'll touch on also. And then there's the power to power in terms of what we term to batteries, fuel cells, etc. Um, I'm only going to touch on these two. That's not to say that heat's not important. Heat's an obvious the elephant in the room um, that we're going to have to address reasonably soon, but it's not the context of my conversation today. It's a complicated landscape, and one of the ways that we can begin to segment it is to have a look at storage duration. And I've deliberately not put any figures on here because um, this is meant to be a relative uh, um, argument. Um, I don't want to get mixed up into whether something is $375 or $400 per whatever. But what you can see is, is that basically the amount of storage that we need or that we have access to, it ranges from minutes to hours, which is kind of covered by the lithium iron roadmap. At the, the days to weeks, it's clear that that's going to be hydrogen plus some, something. And by that, I mean plus could be nitrogen. Um, if you're going to make ammonia, it could be carbon if you want to make methane or methanol or ethanol or something like that. And then you have this middle region, which we think flow batteries fits in here rather well. Other people will tout, um, uh, sorry, Aquion with aqueous sodium iron or EOS with zinc bromine or you guys with um, copper zinc, etc. But it's also clear that this is the interesting area where there is room for new technologies to come into. So, um, why do we think flow batteries are, uh, are kind of key here? Flow batteries got one of the interesting points where we can decouple power and energy. The nice thing with a flow battery is that I can have a stack that may be one megawatt, and I can then have, configure it to be either four megawatt hours or 12 megawatt hours, etc. The issue with flow batteries today which I'll come on to, is that we think that the price point of vanadium flow batteries is not very competitive in this interface region here, which makes it difficult in terms of gaining access um, in terms of early market adoption. Um, and there, um, we're actively considering that there are alternative uh, flow battery chemistries that, that um, provide some kind of competitive advantage. And so what I want to do is to split it up. And basically, I want to say a few words about the lithium iron roadmap and how that looks from our perspective. A few words around flow batteries and then a few words around power to X scenarios. If you take a look at the lithium iron roadmap, then for us again, because we like things simple, yeah, so we fit it into five generations because that way we can uh, understand it a little better. And, and, and with today, we're around generation two, which is the, the, the standard. Technologies that we've got today, lithium-ion phosphate, 
uh, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, lithium nickel manganese cobalt, etc., etc. Characterized by the best kind of energy density you're going to get is somewhere around 280 watt hours per kilogram, perhaps. Um, it's, a, it's the technology which is at scale. It's driven by the automotive industry or mobility sector. And this whole roadmap is driven by that sector. Um, tremendous economies of scale. Roughly speaking, that market is probably three to four times what the uh, predicted uh, stationary market is going to be in the foreseeable future. So these guys are, are driving the, the lithium mine roadmap. The next generation is, is we're putting, they're putting more things like silicon in the anodes or high temperature spinals, etc. This is kind of an incremental game. So lots of incremental improvements. So Tesla will tell you they put three or four or five percent in this year. Panasonic will say similar, blah, blah, blah. Um, but again, it runs out of steam somewhere around 350 watt hours per kilogram. And that's if you're matching it with a high, um, high voltage spinal or something like that. Um, these are in limited deployment. They're happening today, not at these power levels or these um, energy levels, but um, definitely happening. And then we see that there's this jump. Moving from this generation three to this generation four is characterized by basically moving to a lithium metal anode. And uh, we have lithium sulfur in this regime, but there's also the um, solid state technology from CO and some various other uh, technologies. Um, and then there's finally a jump here to lithium air. Um, now, the interesting point for me is that there's a little bit of a battleground here where we have this uh, silicon anode um, with a limited deployment and we also have this uh, lithium sulfur and, and solid state, which is also in uh, um, uh, limited deployment. And these technologies here are going to find uses um, uh, in the new generation of cars, e-buses, aviation, etc., where this weight saving becomes key. But that's, from a Siemens perspective, what's a little bit more interesting and a little bit more important from our perspective is that whilst the technology disruption happens at this cell level, yeah, if I were to scope out what the value chain looks like, okay, the point is, is that whilst all the fancy stuff is here, if I'm going to unlock that for my end customer, somehow I have to bridge into this application profile. And then this brings in this whole idea of what we call device operation. And, and this is, on one side, this is what's linked up into the battery management systems. Yeah, so underlying battery chemistry, trying to model that in, in, in more fidelity in order to squeeze more out in terms of control, what that means in system integration. But there's an awful lot here that also rests on some more, should we say, business-related side of things. Product definition, service and warranty, business planning. Um, uh, if I'm going to have a lease model, uh, somebody's going to end up owning the technical risk. The technical risk is basically defined by this point here, even though basically what's happening here and what I'm selling to my customers there. So this is a, a, a big area for us in terms of uh, uh, monitoring of health, qualification control, and it all rests with an understanding of the battery chemistry. So although we don't necessarily want to step into the chemistry, we don't want to be a cell manufacturer, it, we think it's essential that we actually understand somehow what's going on there. So that's how we view the, to say, the lithium ion roadmap to a certain degree. If I had gone and have a look in advanced flow batteries or flow batteries in general, again, it's a little bit of a zoo out there in terms of what's available. So the standard, should we say, chemistry that is, has, has been uh, deployed up to now is basically around all vanadium with some tweaks maybe in terms of um, uh, the, the electrolyte that's going in there. And there's lots of um, you know, Gildermeister, Fissenkrupp, Sumitomo, Ronka. There's significant installations at significant levels of this technology. Our feeling is, is that in order to really fill that gap between, shall we say, two hours and, and, and two days, that we somehow need to bring the cost down. And so we have a look at so there's some alternative chemistries out there. These are characterized by basically trying to move to lower cost active materials, stepping away from vanadium towards something like maybe zinc bromine or iron chromine, etc. Um, these have some successes, some issues, mostly around um, uh, uh, mixing um, of uh, dissimilar species. And then, but then if you look, there was also this interesting arena here around engineered molecules. And this is just a snapshot of some of the systems that are out there. But you can see that they are focused on two things. The first thing that they're focused on is taking metal out of the electrolyte 
So something like Yina batteries have got a polymer, so there's no metal in there, okay? Or um, like Harvard and Oxford have got um, quinone-based or other hydrocarbon-based systems, so there is no metallic center. The redox center is not metallic. Uh, this obviously means that your electrolyte reduces in cost. And then there's some ideas around, well, the other major cost is around the membrane. Now, okay, most of these batteries traditionally use Nathion. Okay, the stack is a reasonably significant cost. Um, and then there are some chemistries which are interesting in terms of um, either here with symmetric chemistry, so you have exactly the same chemistry on either side of the membrane. What does that mean? Well, that means that the membrane, I can then use cell guard or, or something else as a separator. It's not really a membrane anymore. So that drops the, the, the cost of the stack quite considerably. Um, or the, um, the, the molecule's large. So again, I can step away from nathion um, or an ionomer and, and move to something which is a little bit more uh, cost effective. And so that's just saying here. So um, the, the name of the game is, is that either you reduce, well, I, ideally you like to do both. I like to reduce the electrolyte costs, use low cost materials, get rid of anything expensive in the, as an active species, ideally no metal. Um, also, I can move to non-aqueous. When you non-aqueous, I raise my voltage from 1.4 volts to whatever, 2.4 volts, 2.2 volts. That automatically allows me to, to transfer more energy per metallic ion if I'm doing that. And then reducing the stack cost again by the increasing power density, which is something to do with charge transfer and kinetics, something also again to do with cell voltage, but also reducing the stack cost by decreasing the membrane cost by um, reducing the integrity of the membrane, taking the cost out there. And there's, there's plenty of examples out there. I know that you guys in Southampton are also doing work on this. I just wanted to bring out two examples. One is around Newcastle University. There they have a system around polyoxymetallates. Um, interesting, why? Because it's got fast electron kinetics, higher cell voltage potentially for non-aqueous. And because it's a large membrane, um, sorry, large membrane, <laughs> large molecule, you can get away with a low membrane integrity. You can move away from this um, expensive vacuum. Oxford, interesting also, they've got some work along in terms of symmetric organic. Um, again, um, this is based around vanadium in, in some of these systems. But they've also been looking at some of these other systems, like this diphenyl, I can't even say it, but you can read it. But <laughs> it's a waste product of coal and metal mining. Yeah? It hasn't got any metallic centers, um, and it's symmetric. So um, here you can imagine that if you don't have any expensive metal in there, that you can begin to think of really large systems in terms of um, uh, duration. But the problem here is you're kind of inverting the problem. So this might be a very cheap active species, but you have to dissolve it in something which might be rather expensive. So you're kind of inverting the problem on its head. So this is very early research, but I think it's interesting because it draws out this idea that we don't necessarily need to have metal in our flow batteries. So that's kind of like flow batteries as, as we see it uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to touch on is power to chemicals. And when we talk about power to chemicals, there's, there's, there's two things that we are looking at. And I'm going to use ammonia as an example here, but it doesn't have to be ammonia. Methanol, ethanol, butanol, they're all a similar concept. And generally speaking, chemicals have normally got two, should we say, uses um, from a business point of view. One side of things that they, they could well be a, a commodity that's got a price because it's a precursor for something. Ammonia is a precursor for fertilizer. It's got a, a commodity price on the open market. Yeah? And so it's interesting in just making it because you can sell it. Okay? Then you've got another kind of chemical, which is basically a fuel vector. Okay? And you don't make it necessarily to sell it. You make it because it's a vector for energy. So. Um, but if we just center on, on, on the chemical industry just for now, the chemical industry is quite an interesting place because it's, it's actually a vital part of our modern life. Everything that we do is centered in it. Um, but they are faced with um, the problem of, of growing carbon emissions, finite resources, or should we say the resources may well be gas coming from Russia or, or other um, geopolitical areas where you, where you want to be able to divorce yourself from, from some kind of instability um, in terms of security supply. And these large challenges represent an opportunity for business through this what we call electrification of, of the chemical industry. And if you just have a look at what the chemical industry emissions are, 
Um, they contribute roughly 8% in terms of the world energy, roughly 4.5-5% in terms of the carbon emissions. Um, of that, ammonia is quite an interesting one, and the reason why we picked it up is because every ton of ammonia that you make normally, minimum produces two tons of carbon dioxide. Okay, more if you're doing it in China with coal, or India with naphtha and heavy oil. So, and the issue here is, is that it's uh, roughly 2% of the world's fossil energy goes into it. The other issue is that we can't really do without ammonia. So 80% of the population is alive today because the ammonia that goes into fertilizer. So it's one of those chemicals that you cannot think of doing without unless we get rid of a lot of people. So this means it's, it's, it's a chemical that's, that's hugely strategically important. It's not something that's going to go away. Um, we know that um, the market for ammonia is steadily increasing. Um, uh, the population is not showing any signs yet of slowing down necessarily. So um, this makes it an interesting place. And, and, and here in terms also, if you look at the size of the ammonia market, 180 million tons of it shipped around and, 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 and made every year corresponds to roughly 100 billion euros a year market. That's for the actual thing. The capital market is obviously a little bit less than that. So, and it's going up at somewhere between 3 and 5% a year, which means every year you need to increase your capacity by 3 and 5%, which is, represents a, a reasonably large amount of, of capex that goes into it year on year. The other nice thing of ammonia is that it's pretty easy to make in a renewable way. So um, we can take nitrogen from the air, which is relatively easily done with an air separation unit. It's not as complicated as using carbon capture or anything like that, um, readily available technology. And you take water and some energy, you split the water into hydrogen, and you can make your, your ammonia. Um, and the other nice thing of ammonia also is that you can also think of uh, solutions where you don't just take the ammonia and then sell it onto the open market. You can also use it as an energy vector. Um, and, and this is being considered also for places in like Japan is very active, Korea is very active in this arena because they want to import hydrogen, okay? And they are got plans for doing it with um, cooled hydrogen ships, et cetera, yeah, minus whatever, 200 and whatever degrees Celsius. Well, another alternative route is you make your hydrogen, put it into ammonia, ship it over at whatever it is, minus 20 degrees Celsius, and then crack it the other end back into hydrogen. So there's various solutions around this. Um, and we're exploring that in a, in a rather small scale, so we have a small-scale pilot that's going on in uh, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Here we have some containers. So we have a um, hydrogen electrolyzer. We've got an air separation unit. We've got a, uh, um, an ammonia synthesis container. We've also got an um, internal combustion engine that then generates electricity running on ammonia. We hook it up to the, um, a wind turbine. Um, this is done as a consortium between a number of different universities. And we're going to evaluate how that system uh, uh, um, flies. Um, it should be operational sometime next year. That's just a more detail. Okay. So I suppose what I really wanted to, to, to get the message across is that um, uh, in terms of energy storage and, and for electricity energy storage, it's not just about lithium ion. Lithium ion is really important. Uh, but there are other technologies beyond that. And the way that the market is evolving, lithium iron is, is, is going to reign supreme in a certain portion of the market. But there's also other parts of the market which are ripe for innovation in terms of uh, new materials and new concepts. I guess that's it. So. A long, long discussion after that one. <laughs> My goodness me. Yeah. So, does anybody have any uh, any quick questions or comments? Was I in time? Oh, good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a um, you know, people talk about the possibility of a hydrogen economy. Yep. What do you think about an ammonia economy? Um, I think that ammonia... Uh, could possibly have its place as an energy vector. I wouldn't, I, and, and I would see an ammonia economy and a hydrogen economy being very similar. It's, uh, ammonia is a nice way of transporting 
hydrogen from A to B and storing hydrogen. Um, whether or not you would want to use ammonia at the point of contact or the point of use depends on there being suitable storage materials developed that can store it in like a solid state type affair. For instance, in a, if you wanted to use it in a car, um, I wouldn't necessarily do it in its raw form. I would encapsulate it in some amine or some other solid state that uh, if you have an accident, it's not going to be released, etc. So, um, but I don't, I don't foresee there being any intrinsic difficulties in having ammonia in here. So. Any other questions, comments? Um, you kind of t talk, spoke more about the cost drivers and, and looked at how lithium ion has that place yeah. and the, the reasons why other technologies are coming in around cost. What about the safety aspects of lithium ion? How much of a driver is that to move towards other technologies? Um, that's a very good point. It's. Uh, yes, it is going to be a driver. I mean, but also within, the, you also have to look at the, the lithium iron zoo, should we say, has got some chemistries that are more safe than others. Lithium iron phosphate is, 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 should we say, much safer than some of the other higher energy versions. Um, I think, yes, it will be an issue. It has to be addressed. Um, that's why also when I look at device operation, should we say, um, it is key to have that understanding when you guys are looking at film or runaway, etc. Um, so I think safety is an issue um, and there are a number of strategies that, that you need to, to do to, to mitigate against it. Um, having said that, there's an awful lot of scale behind lithium iron to solve those issues. Um, particularly in that, should we say, you know, zero hours to two hours market area, um, I would question whether or not any technology can really make inroads into that area. I think that, other than that, I think that the the the, um, the landscape is, is is more open. So, so one quick question. What um. <laughs> I'll shut it up in that case. <laughs> what role is legislation going to play in all of this? I mean, if we're looking at sort of long-term energy storage, um, then it's going to be uneconomic. So it will have to be driven by sort of public benefits. And yep. I mean, if we want to, we're going to have to have a strategic energy storage from non-fossil fuel sources, hydrogen, underground compressed hydrogen. But it's never, ever going to be economic in the same way that lithium-ion battery is going to be economic. So what, what, do, what do we need in terms well, of... Well, the big discussion is always, uh, for a lot of these business cases, is what is the carbon cost going to be in the future? And that's a major driver for... Uh, that's going to drive the market. Into, and, and I can't... I, I don't have a crystal ball, if you mean, to, to tell what that is. But we, we have some degree of... of um, we know that it's, what, seven euros a ton at the moment? Uh, yeah, um, I would expect that if we have to address these issues, uh, that that has to somehow increase. So, um, and my suspicion is is that we will see it happening in a heterogeneous manner. For instance, California mandates that you sh thou shalt have two gigawatts or whatever it is of That's energy about storage. Yeah? Yeah? About, about California. So, and then there's going to be other places like Hawaii, where mm -hmm. they're also an island state. They've also got a lot of TV there, where you have to be able to do something uh, uh, differently because it's um, prohibited to do it any other way. Um, we know that China is pushing it with its EV, with its... Um, electrified mobility really heavily because its cities are choking. So these drivers will come in, um, and um, but they will require, should we say, some external interaction in the market to actually make it happen. Yeah. So. Thanks for that, started. Um, I mean, we, we're going to need legislation, but we, we've seen too many examples in Europe of when bad legislation has all sorts of unwanted consequences, in particular biodiesel 
deforestation. But we need good legislation, and for good legislation, we need people who understand energy storage inside out and know how the whole thing fits together. So hopefully, I see it to you. Know, the little oh, the next little generation have to make something of it, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.